Well, I want to welcome you to the Love First podcast, and I want to ask you, how are you doing? How are things going? Because I realize that from day to day, week to week, sometimes hour by hour, this is a tough times. We can find ourselves kind of on a a roller coaster, and things can be so unsettling. Sometimes they're as unsettling as our own bodies, our own health, our own frame of mind, and sometimes as unsettling as world events. We look across the nations, we look across the world, we hear of the blast in Beirut, and our hearts just sink. We hear of wars and famines, but we hear of people losing their jobs, people going to the hospital. We hear of people having to go through another funeral, and it surely breaks our heart. And so here at the Love First podcast, we want to just take a moment and recognize that these are difficult times. One of my friends posted the other day that we must remember that joy is as much a part of being a follower of Christ as grief. We learn to rejoice with those who rejoice as we mourn with those who mourn, But it can be tough to find our joy. If this is your first time, I want to thank you for joining us. Our purpose at the Love First podcast is to catalyze courageous conversations to revolutionize the way we love. If you are joining us again, if you're returning, I want to say thank you. And thank you for telling your friends, for liking, subscribing, and sharing, and for making the most of this opportunity to equip ourselves for these important conversations. In this episode, we are going to talk about staying with God through the hardest conversations. Love first, I know. Love first, I know. Lord, take control. Lord, take control. Love first in my soul. So oftentimes when we're in great stress and fatigue, we find ourselves kind of becoming nostalgic. And I don't mean that in a bad way at all. What I actually mean is, is we find ourselves longing for what seemed to be a simpler time in life. And we use certain phrases to describe it, right? We say things like, man, we just need to get back to that old time religion, or we need to get back to the pure gospel. We need to get back to the Bible. And we're not alone in this journey. There's a Christian hymn that goes something like this. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedoms we all hold dear now are at stake. Humbling your hearts to God, save from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians awake. And I can remember a lot of people being pretty critical of that song, including me, until I learned that that song was actually written in April of 1942, just months earlier. Pearl Harbor had been attacked. We were drawn into war. And this song was written. But I want you to think about the song. The song wasn't written as a judgment on the nations or a judgment against other nations. The song was actually written to the people of God. And the song says, wake up. Seek the way pilgrims trod means that you would reinvest in that old, old story of God. But when you think of that old, old story of God, where does your mind go? Where does it drift? Well, you might think, well, I've only been a believer a short period of time. Well, what were the stories that captured your heart that helped you come to Christ? Some of you are saying, man, I've been a believer since I was in my mother's womb. Well, where does your mind go? Here's the stories I think of. I think of Adam and Eve. And I think of Noah and the ark or Abraham and Sarah. I think of Joseph and the coat of many colors. I think of Moses and the Exodus, and I can't get, you know, Charlton Heston out of my mind, right? Uh, I think about David and Goliath. I think about people like Daniel in the lion's den or, or the three young Hebrew men in the fiery furnace. I think about Esther saving Israel and Joseph and Mary. 
I think about Peter and I think about the ministry of Paul. Where did your mind go? And if you went to vacation Bible school, maybe, what might have happened is you might have thought, wait a minute, Don, you've left out one of the pantheon, the, the, the three stories that always made the vacation Bible school uh, cycle always included at least once every few years, Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the big fish, the story of Jonah. And that's the story we're going to look at in this episode. Now, it's not a long story if you're interested. Uh, you, if you have an audible Bible, I did this three times to check it out. You can actually listen to the story of Jonah in seven minutes on the audible Bible. Some of you are thinking that would be perfect for every sermon from now on. Well, fascinating enough, the book of Jonah isn't actually a sermon and it barely qualifies as prophecy. It is the most famous of what's called the minor prophets, the 12 smaller prophetic writings. It's the most famous of all of those. In fact, Jonah is one of the four writing prophets that Jesus actually names along with Isaiah, Daniel, and Zechariah. So how did this story become so famous? I think one of the reasons the story is famous is because we feel like we can relate. So let's take a few moments and go through the story. It's the story of Jonah the prophet, referenced earlier in Scripture as son of Amittai and from this town not too far from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, yet predating Jesus by probably at least seven and a half centuries. Jonah is a prophet of God, and God simply says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, which was a chief city of the nation of Assyria, and I want you to go and preach to them because their wickedness has just boiled over before me. And so as the famous story goes, uh, rather than Jonah the prophet saluting the Lord and heading to Nineveh, he heads in the exact opposite direction. He goes down to the port city of Joppa, and as best as we can tell, uh, it seems like he heads clear to the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. But on his way, a great storm arises. And Jonah's on this boat with people that are not Hebrew. They're crying out to their gods. It's an extremely religious group of sailors. They are all crying out to their gods. And finally, they look at Jonah and say, uh, hey, you, you got something to do with this? Who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? Who are your people? And Jonah basically raises his hand and says, it's me. Now, I told you guys earlier as we were kind of sailing out of port that I'm running from God. I'm a Hebrew. I serve the God Yahweh. And the only way you guys are going to come out of this thing alive is you got to throw me overboard. And the sailors are like, no, 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 no. We don't want to do that. And we're afraid that the gods will hold that against us, uh, that we kill an innocent man. So they row harder. They're trying to get back to the port, but to no avail. And so with heavy hearts and prayers on their lips, they throw Jonah overboard. So Jonah goes overboard, and the sea immediately is calm. Apparently, the sailors are now deeply convicted about Yahweh, and they sail on having this new respect and honor for the God of Jonah. But Jonah sinks into the sea. And we really need to read what happens in chapter 2. Now, the Lord provided. The Lord will do a lot of providing during this particular little four-chapter book. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Now, it should be noted that huge fish was the common translation for centuries and centuries and centuries until as the Bible began to come into European languages, eventually the word whale was finally substituted in and kind of became uh, the standard way of translating it. And finally, in later more modern translations, it drifted back to just the original, some, some large fish, right? So the Lord provides this huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. Now, what you're going to notice about the four chapter book of Jonah is God is referenced 39 times, 39. 
God's the hero 25 times as Yahweh. It's not just the gods. It's the God of the Hebrews who is the hero of the story. That's the God that Jonah addresses. And one time, from the belly of the fish, he addresses him as Lord God. In distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep, in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas. And the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I have said I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountains I sank. Into the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. You see, there's this descent, 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 further descending into the very Sheol of their imagination of the cosmology of the time. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you in your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And with that turn of events, the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. Now that's quite a chapter, wouldn't you agree? You go from a storm on the seas to a conversion experience of the sailors, You get thrown overboard, have your own conversion experience from the depth of the sea. You basically say, I was riding high. I went to the depths, down to the grave, down to the pit. I cried out to God. God answered my prayer as the loving God always does. God redeemed me. And now I praise you saying, salvation belongs to our God. And at that, God says, well, it looks like our work here is done, fish. Vomit up up on dry land. And then we come to chapter 3. So Jonah then decides, I'm heading to Nineveh. Dr. Philip Camp of Lipscomb University, one of my former professors, says that you could take the book of Jonah and divide it into two parts. God commands Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah disobeys is part one. God commands Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah obeys And that's part two. But what we'll begin to notice is that there's comparisons between part one and part two that keep playing out. And what happens in Nineveh is one of those comparisons. Look at Jonah chapter three. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It was three days. Uh, it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, and then he sets up to preach, and he proclaims, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, bear in mind, this is one of the prophetic books. This is the only prophecy in the book. One line. Forty days, and Nineveh is in the, is in the dumpster. The Ninevites believed God. Now, can we stop and just remember the implications of a phrase like that? This is the same phrase that's used with Abraham. Abraham believed God. This is the phrase that the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4 actually reaches back and says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham didn't know where he was going, but he believed God, and that was enough for God and credited his righteousness. The Ninevites believed God, didn't know where it was going, but it was enough for God. And he credited it as righteousness. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, 
covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, notice he brought in his cabinet. By decree of the king and his cabinet, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. That's kind of a comedic moment in the story that even the animals are somehow complicit in this and they're even repenting in sackcloth and ashes, right? Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence, that wickedness that summoned God's wrath in the first place. Who knows? See, they don't even know what's going to happen. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Now, if we understand the timeline of history as best we can understand ancient history, it would appear to be that this was a time when the Assyrian nation was, uh, empire was not as strong. It had gone through a time of weak leadership and, and, and contraction. So maybe, just maybe, having been humbled, their hearts were more open to repenting. Well, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Wow, that's a strange turn of events. What an unusual experience. Some guy shows up that hopefully had washed along the way so he doesn't smell like the inside of a fish. He walks into town one day, sets up shop, and gives a one-line testimony that says 40 days and you're done. Not 40 days and you're done unless you repent. Not, hey, there's a loving God that's trying to get your attention. You've got kind of, you know, about a month and 10 days to get your stuff together. None of that. 40 days and you go under is all Jonah says. But the people's hearts were touched by a God that would warn them of their impending doom. And that was enough to shift their hearts. Did you notice the way that the king repented? He did something that we hear later in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus. He emptied himself. He took off his royal robes. He took off his robes that gave him the honor and the privilege and the glory that went with being king. And he stripped himself of all of that. And it doesn't say he sat down on his throne and gave the decree to repent. It says he sat in the dust and gave his decree to repent. The grassroots movement of repentance from the initial preaching of Jonah reached the ears of the king, and rather than the king trying to suppress the grassroots repentance, the king joins the grassroots repentance. The king says, you're right. God is right. The prophet is right. Let's repent of our wickedness and our evil ways. Wow. You might think to yourself, huh, if, if this was the Apostle Paul, I wonder what he would do. Because in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul, when he sees something like this, man, he, he moves into town. Remember that? He stays in one place for 18 months, maybe another place for 36 months. He kind of writes a letter and says, I meant to get to you, but a big door opened up over here and I'm staying. I'm so excited. So we might think that Jonah would be like, man... I didn't bring a change of clothes, but I'm staying in Nineveh because what a door has been opened. Or he might have even just said something like, wow, obviously God is at work among you. God was at work in this city. No need for me to stay because I, like you, I'm kind of on the road to repentance here. So it looks like God has done a great work in you and a great work in me and a great work in the sailors. But we have a fourth chapter. And it's that fourth chapter that challenges me to ask, is this just a whale of a tale? Or is this truth for today? 
Because chapter 4 begins, but to Jonah. This seemed very wrong. In the original Hebrew, this seemed to be a huge mistake. In fact, if you take apart that Hebrew word, what God is doing seems worthless to Jonah. And he became very angry. The word in the original Hebrew, Jonah is burning up. He's fired up. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wow! If you had never read this story before, would you have imagined that turn? Would you have imagined that the script would go that direction, that act four, rather than a victory lap, is a complaint? Man, if you're God, how do you respond? Verse four, the Lord replied, Is it, is it right for you to be angry? Is this right for you to be angry? Well, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he had made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. I think he had his fingers crossed that maybe if he just waited long enough, mad enough, that God would finally come back around with fire from heaven and burn the city like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, instead of the Lord continuing the conversation, the Lord provides, again, a visual aid. Verse 6 of chapter 4, Well, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade to his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn, the next day, God provided. I told you God keeps providing, and I think Jonah would have loved it if God had quit providing right after the plant. The next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's very hot head, if you remember, so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And the Lord picks up the conversation with a similar question he had just asked earlier. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Hmm. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Should not I, the Lord says, have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. So in chapter 4, if we can summarize it, Jonah is angry about the implications of staying close to a God like that. You see, Jonah, if he was here right now, might actually say two things. Number one, hey everyone, when the Bible was being written, we didn't know it was being written all the time, and so we weren't aware that like one of our books was going like, to make the big book and that you guys would be talking about us like 2,700 years later at some of our most embarrassing moments. Maybe he would say something like that. But Jonah might say, hey, everyone, in chapter 4, there's a little, there's a little flag waving, this little yellow flag waving, and that little yellow flag is supposed to signal to you what the book is about. He said, what I got to tell you is the book is not about 
someone who gets a call from God, refuses the call from God, has a change of heart, and does the will of God. He said, that's too simplistic for my book. He said, see, the story of my life, when I, when I wave this little yellow flag in chapter 4, I tell you that the reason I didn't want to go to Nineveh and the reason I got on that boat and the reason I tried to escape is because I already knew what God was like before I ever left home. Jonah says, I didn't have to sit out east of Nineveh and sit up on a sand dune and stare at the city and wonder what God will do. I already knew. I knew before I ever left home. And that's why I didn't want to come to Nineveh. That's why I tried to escape this mission because I already knew the implications of staying close to a God like this. I already knew. Notice the four characteristics that he says about God. I already knew that you're com gracious compassionate, slow to anger, relenting of sending calamity. I already knew that. Those are the same sets of words that are talked about in Torah. Same sets of words that are talked about in the Psalms and the other wisdom literature. Same sets of words that other prophets use. You see in the Hebrew scriptures of the Torah, the wisdom literature and the prophets, the, the uh, uh, Torah, the Kethavim and the Nevi'im, in all of those, it's the same God. He said, I already knew this God. This God of grace, this God of compassion, this God of patience, this God who actually I knew in advance wanted to save the Ninevites. This is the God who tells the prophet Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. Jonah says, I already knew that's who I was going to Nineveh with. And that's why I didn't want to go. So don't think that I just didn't want another long, you know, preaching trip. Don't think that I, I, did, I specifically, I just don't like Nineveh. That's not it. It's that I don't like it when God acts like God. And it makes me angry when God will not shift God's identity, God's purposes, and God's behavior when it fits my desires. And that's why I'm mad. And so when God asked me, did I have the right to be mad the first time? I just walked out on the conversation. He asked me that in verse 4, and I walked out in verse 5. I just walked out and built myself a little shelter, and I just sat there and crossed my fingers, kind of saying to God, basically, I'm waiting. But God waited on me. And God sent this plant. God provided the plant. God grew the plant. God provides the sun, the rain, the nutrients. God provides everything that grows anything. And when God provided that plant, I didn't think about the fact that this was supposed to teach me a lesson. I was just glad that I was finally getting some relief. I was glad that I could finally relax. I was glad that my fatigue was being addressed. I was glad that all of that stress was kind of now being relieved, and I was kind of sitting in the shade again, and I was relaxing again, and now I could feel comfort again. Maybe God finally understands how important it is for me to be comfortable. But then you know what he did? He provided two more times. Oh, not that I wanted it. So he sends a worm that kills the plant. And then after the plant dies, he sends a scorching wind. I'm already red hot angry. And he sends a red hot wind. Now I'm boiling. And he comes back and restarts the conversation right where he left off and says, What are you so mad about? Why are you so angry? He said, think about this vine. You didn't have anything to do with it. You were just glad you had it. It didn't cost you anything. You were just thankful that you had what you wanted. It never dawned on you what I wanted, let alone what the Ninevites wanted let alone what those sailors wanted. 
You see, in part one of the book and part two of the book, you see people that are not Hebrew, people that are not of, the, uh, of Jonah's people, longing for God, having their hunger for God quenched. And there sits Jonah, oblivious to the desires of God. Hmm. This is a hard conversation that Jonah's in, isn't it? And he doesn't like it. You see, one of the things I noticed throughout the book of Jonah is that he keeps trying to escape. He escapes on his way to Tarshish, but on the boat, he basically says, you know what? I'd just rather die than kind of try to live through this thing. The sailors are all about living through it. They care more about Jonah's life than Jonah cares about his life. Do you know how much, did you notice how much Jonah talks about dying in chapter four? I'm so mad I could die. I just wish I could die. It'd be better if I died. I don't think Jonah was voting for the cessation of his physical life. I think Jonah was constantly wanting to escape the implications of being in a hard conversation with God. I think he wanted a way out. I think he wanted God to be kind of a nostalgic God. A God that knows who the good people are and the bad people are. A God who knows who to kill and who to let live. A God who knows that Ninevites, you don't need to send me to Nineveh, Nineveh to proclaim something to them. Just do them in. Don't, don't waste my time going over there. Just wipe them out because that's actually all Ninevites are good for. See, Jonah thinks he got converted in the belly of the fish. God knew, I've got Jonah's actions, but I don't have Jonah's heart. I've got his actions. He's going to go preach. But what chapter 4 proved is he still didn't have Jonah's heart. Chuck Swindoll, in some of his devotional thoughts about this story, says just that, that God knew that though the Ninevites had repented from the heart, Jonah still had a hard heart toward the desires of God, and God's grace toward Nineveh only heightened our awareness of Jonah's hardness of heart toward the purposes of God. So now have we ruined the Jonah story? Don't we wish it was just a whale of a tale instead of some hard conversation? Why do they all have to be hard conversations? Couldn't God have just said to Jonah, hey Jonah, thanks for preaching, you did a great job. Why don't you go ahead and head on back over to Israel? Jonah kind of gets out of town And then God says to the king of Nineveh, way to go, good job on repentance, way to go. And God kind of takes care of Nineveh, kind of uh, on the sly. Why does he put Jonah right in the middle of Jonah's enemies repenting? Why does he put Jonah in the middle of a situation that he knows Jonah doesn't want to be in? Why does God turn up the heat when Jonah's already mad? Because you see, just as God wanted Nineveh to repent and give their heart to him, God wanted Jonah to repent. So at this point, it's kind of fascinating that the conversation about Jonah goes a lot of different directions. And one of the conversations is, hey, Don, do you think that the the story of Jonah is like real, like it's like true? I mean, like, do you think that's like a true story? Do you think it's like, like history? And I'm like, what? It's like, you know, I mean, I mean, we've done, you know, anatomical investigations of whales and fish all over the world, and none of them, you know, would fit this description. You know, they, they, they uh, uh, either they would have teeth that would chew them up, or their throat is too small, and he choked to death on the way through. Uh, their, the acid content would surely destroy him in, in three days, or they'd throw him up a lot sooner than that. I mean, come on, you know, the story of the whale, come on, that's a, that is a whale of a 
tale, right? And let's talk about Nineveh. You know, this wasn't the capital city yet. This was just a chief city, not a capital city. And when we found the ruins of Nineveh, which of course we have found the ruins of Nineveh, you know, it didn't take three days to walk across that basic city. So, you know, the facts of the story, they're just not true. And who believes in big fish and people in fish for three days and, you know, storms being calmed. I mean, come on. Surely you know, Don, that the story isn't true. Hmm. Well, that's one way to go with the story of Jonah is when the conversation gets hard, why don't we find another argument to have? to distract us from the implications of the hard conversation with God. You know, it is fascinating that Jesus said, there's a lesson to be learned from the story of Jonah. As I mentioned, Jonah is only one of four of the writing prophets that Jesus actually names. The references to Jonah are in Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 16, and Luke chapter 11. In Matthew 12 and in Luke 11, the stories are companion stories, some people that are the opposition to Jesus come up to him and say, hey, we want a sign. We want proof. We want to see some ID. We want to see some facts that you are who you say you are. You know, you're saying all these things. You're preaching all these things. You're kind of making us look bad, right? You know, the people think, ooh, Jesus, what a great new rabbi. You know, and they're not looking to us. Every time we say something, they kind of want, you know, you know, does Jesus approve? You know, so Jesus, you need to produce a sign that proves who you are. Now, bear in mind, you realize I mentioned that, the men- that these references are in Matthew 12, Matthew 16, and in Luke chapter 11. Jesus has already done teaching after teaching after teaching after teaching. He's already done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. He has already fed the 5,000 men plus their wives and children. He's already fed the 4,000. He's already done the signs, but it's never enough. Because you see, if you don't want to believe something, no sign is going to be enough. No truth is going to be enough. So Jesus says, it's actually a wicked generation that wants a sign. Now that harkens back to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2. It was the wickedness of Nineveh that had risen to the attention of God's wrath. Jesus said it's a wicked generation that wants a sign like you're asking for. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. A sign will be given. It will be the sign of Jonah. That as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. That will be the sign. What, to what is Jesus referring? Jesus is referring to his death and his resurrection. Jesus is saying that I have come to give life and my resurrection will be the sign that shows the world That God is the God who watches the descent of humanity into the pit of sin and wickedness. And God is the God who never takes his eyes off of that humanity, never takes his heart, never disengages his heart from that humanity, loves that humanity, never longs for the death of that new humanity, never takes pleasure in the death of that humanity. And it is that God who meets humanity in the bowels of the earth, in the depths of the earth, in the depths of destruction despair, and through Christ Jesus raises humanity to hope. That's the sign, the sign of Jonah. And then Jesus says, and something greater than Jonah is here. That's very insightful. In the companion passage in Mark, Jonah isn't mentioned, but the sign, the same sign is mentioned. But just previous to it, the Bible says, Jesus sighed deeply. Come on, Jesus. 
Prove yourself. Give us the facts that will that, that we can that will register with us so that we can finally believe that you're right about something. And Jesus just sighs so deeply because they're they're missing the whole story. Just like God with Jonah realizing his prophet knows the language of prophecy but lacks the heart doesn't grasp the big story of what God is doing because he wants to escape the implications of who God is. I want you to think with me for a few moments right now about the story of Jonah and who you might be in that story. Well, we might say, oh, no, I'm, I'm Jonah, I'm Jonah, I can relate to Jonah, I've been relating to Jonah since I was young, you know, I, I relate to God calling me to obedience, calling me to obedience, and, and I resist, and then I stumble, and I fall, and I'm down in the pit, and God rescues me from the pit and puts me back on my feet, and I start to obey God again. You do realize we've already talked about that. That's not the story of Jonah. That is a part of the story of Jonah. That's not the story. The story of Jonah is, I knew what God was like. And that's why I resisted. I did not want to be in a situation with God where one more time, God loves the people I'm mad at, and God saves the people that I want destroyed. And God listens to the people that I want to shut up. I didn't want any more of that. And that's why I didn't want to go to Nineveh. And Jesus says, pay attention to that story. Because Jesus said to his accusers, you're just like them. You asked, did he really say that? Go and read what he said in Matthew 12. He said, in judgment. This is in the Bible. In judgment, that they would stand in judgment and the people of Nineveh would be called forward to stand with them. And that God would say, while you were over here arguing about the historicity of Jonah, the people of Nineveh who craved my heart craved my presence and actually responded in repentance to a very hard conversation rather than looking for escapes running the other direction they just stopped in their tracks and said lord tell me what it means and tell me what to do lord we want to begin with repentance we don't even have to know the implications we know what life without you looks like. We only want life with you, no matter what it means. Jonah, on the other hand, like Jesus' accusers, stands there and says, God, I'm telling you right now, I'm tired of you being you. You see, I think Jesus would have been more popular with his accusers if Jesus would have just quit being Jesus. If he wouldn't have held on to his identity as filled with the power and the might and the wisdom and the love of God. How do we apply this today? Well, one thing we might want to think about is, who does God love that we're mad at? Or, who does God listen to that we're tired of listening to? Or, who does God want to save that we don't care if they make it or not in reality? But maybe there's a second order question that we need to address. And that is this. Why are we so addicted to escaping the hard conversations? Why do we want to, to escape? Why do we want to find a way out? And I don't just mean like Jonah did, walk out on the conversation with God or, 
you know, leave a conversation, walk away from a conversation, say I'm fed up with the conversation, shut down a conversation. I don't just mean that. But I mean get distracted from what the real conversation is. Because here's what, here's what I've noticed. And I want to stop and I want to drive a stake in the ground. Here's what I've noticed. When we talk about issues of justice, and it kind of starts getting to us, right, and digging at us. When we talk about sexism, right, or racism, or, you know, we start talking about uh, uh, questions that center around white supremacy or white privilege or uh, things like that, right? Many of us, even right now, we, we like Jonah, we get red hot, we get upset, we don't want to be in the conversation, we want to walk out. Somebody says to us, why are you so upset? We just walk away. We, we look for an escape or we shut down or we get upset. You know what I mean? We, we kind of think it through like, like, or we process it like Jonah, right? And then rather than stepping back in and just saying, okay, God, I, I know you want what's best for me. I know you want to grow me. I know you want to mature me, Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you. I'm going to stay with you even in the hardest conversation. We find ourselves doing what people do with the story of Jonah. Well, do you think that's true? I mean, like I, I read an article, you know, about systemic racism, and, and, and I, I don't think that's real, you know, or what do you think of the research around critical race theory, you know, and well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's even a real thing, or, you know, I, I don't believe in the white privilege, or I don't believe in these things. And the next thing you know, we have shifted the conversation to argue about a theory when our hearts remain unconverted untransformed and unchristlike. So we find ourselves, I've been this person where I'm like Jonah. I don't want to stay in the hard conversation with God. I don't want to stay with God in the hardest conversation because I know what's going to happen. I've been in enough conversations with God. I know he wants to transform me. I've been in enough hard conversations with God that he wants me with an unveiled face to behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord so that I will be converted, I will be transformed, and I will become Christ-like. Can you relate to this? It's not easy, is it? So when, when someone says, you understand that man, through the experiences of the last several months, I've had a change of heart, and I now can say with confidence, black lives matter, and it hits us in a certain way, and we don't like the discomfort that we feel, and something boils within us, and so then we go to the Black Lives Matter website, we begin to read down through it, we pick up on the things that we don't agree with, and then we come back, and we want to argue the validity of the political points of a Black Lives Matter website, rather than having a converted heart that says, I have lived in inequity. I have allowed inequity. I have not pursued justice like the Lord would want me to. And God, you've got my heart. I am ready to repent in sackcloth and ashes. I'm ready to take off my royal robes rather than making a decree from the throne of my intellectual superiority. I'm going to sit in the dust with the king of Nineveh so that in judgment I won't be judged by the king of Nineveh. Oh, yeah, this is not an easy conversation, is it? <laughs> when I think to myself, I just want to get back to the Bible. I just want a vacation Bible school life. Take me back to the whale of a tail. I want the story of Jonah. Now what I might say is, I want the first three chapters. I don't know if I want chapter four. Hmm. There was a controversial 20th century literary professor and theorist, Joseph Campbell. And in 1949, he wrote a book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces. And his theory was that there's kind of one story, one mono myth that goes throughout uh, world history. And it has local iterations and the story is told in different ways, but kind of it's this general way that stories get told. And there was a lot of critique of his theory. There was a lot of wonderment about his theory. Uh, someone no less uh, famous than George Lucas, you remember, 
uh, director of Star Wars movies who said that, yes, he had listened to some of his lectures and it played into how he wrote the storyline. But the storyline basically was developed in 17 stages. And the 17 stages of the hero myth that, that spans all cultures and all history was kind of a call to adventure, a resistance to the call, and then some kind of crisis that makes them encounter the gods. And through that crisis, with the aid of the gods, they kind of rethink the, the whole thing. And, and the rethinking part, in Campbell's theory, was called the belly of the whale. Phase five, or stage five, the belly of the whale. He rooted it in the story of Jonah. And the idea is that in the belly of the whale, this transformation takes place, and you finish out 12 more steps to the 17 steps of, of this hero myth. But it, but it breaks down. Campbell's theory doesn't work with the story of Jonah in particular, even though he references it. And that's because in Campbell's theory, the way that the myth always ends is that the hero of the story has a change of heart, is equipped in a new way, returns to society, and is a boon and blessing to the society. But that's not how the story of Jonah ends. The story of Jonah ends in a standoff where God says to Jonah, you have no right to be angry about a plant because you see, I have chosen compassion for these people. And if you're my prophet, surely you would see the disconnect between the way you're approaching people and the way I'm approaching people. So we're left there with no resolution. Did Jonah have a change of heart? On the way home, did Jonah finally get it? We don't know. Because the way the book of Jonah ends is where we are right now. What will we do? Will we, with arms folded, just say, nope, I'm not accepting that. That, that, that. That's not truth for today. And turn it into an argument over the historicity of Jonah. Or, I don't, I'm not going to stay in these hard conversations about equity and justice and sexism and racism and classism. I'm not staying in these hard conversations. You know, you got to off. You know, you got to give me a sign. You got to give me proof. I don't think this part of that theory holds water. Da 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 da. And it creates a tremendous distraction from the change of heart that God demonstrates. Remember this: the people of Nineveh really were wicked, and God loved them in their wickedness. They were not informed. The last verse says, you get 120,000 people don't know the right hand from the left hand. They're not informed. They don't know what they're doing. But like Jesus from the cross who said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. God says, this is the starting point. They believed. And I credited it to him as righteousness, just like Abraham. Could we step back? And say, Lord, there's nothing I want more than to be close to your heart. Nothing I want more than to be close to your mind. Nothing I want more than to live in the world the way you live in the world. Nothing I want more than to be transformed in how I view Nineveh. So that I would love Nineveh the way that you do. Because the truth is, my worldview isn't what I see in the world. It's the lens through which I see the world. And if the lens through which I see the world is that God should not love the people I'm mad at or that God should not go to such great lengths to save the people that I don't think need to be saved or don't even want to be saved or that God would rejoice when people take an incomplete step and want me to rejoice with them. Oh, that's the challenge, isn't it? So I'll leave it with you. Is this just a whale of a tail? Or is Jonah truth for today? Thank you so much for joining us for the Love First podcast. Remember to share, like, and subscribe. 
And let's catalyze some courageous conversations to revolutionize the way that we love. Love first, I know.